Well, we continue our series. You're going to hear me say the same series for a few more weeks. <clears throat> We're not even halfway through yet. We continue our series, uh, The Year with Jesus. And uh, this week as I was processing this, uh, this year with Jesus and, and reading through our scriptures, I was reminded of the What Would Jesus Do bracelets. You guys remember those? Anybody still have their What Would Jesus Do bracelets? Some of you do? I, I had one, and I had wrapped it around a deck of Uno cards. Because <laughs> I wanted to keep the, the bracelet, and I went to look for it last night, and I don't know what your game cabinets look like, but our game cabinets look like if you open it, you're lucky if everything doesn't fall out. Um, but if you touch one thing, it's all going to fall out. And because the dog was there last night, I decided not to dig. So I didn't find my what would Jesus do bracelet. But I still remember this, this theme of what would Jesus do. And, and, and always asking these questions. What would Jesus do? And I think it's a good question to ask. But I think a, a better question to ask would be WDJS or WDJD. In other words, what did Jesus say? And what did Jesus do? It's easy for us to, to think what would he do because we can kind of filter that through our lens of well, he, he would do what I want him to do. He would, he would say what I want him to say. But one of the challenges in our culture is that that we have more access to information about, about Jesus than any culture previous, and yet we are less familiar with who Jesus actually is. One of the classes that I teach, I've probably shared this story before, but one of the classes I teach is an introduction to Christianity course for um, non-religion non majors. So it's for nursing students or business students or education students. And one of the, the courses, the, the first paper they have to write is kind of telling me their faith story. And one of the, the students wrote a paper talking about how important John 3.16 was to her. How her grandfather had instilled this verse into her heart at a very young age. He had just passed away right before the course started and, and it was such a meaningful verse to her. And then at the end of the paper, she quoted John 3.16. It was when there was only one set of footprints that you carried me. Now some of you are scratching your head and saying, that's not John 3.16. That's a, not even in the Bible. That's a poem called Footprints in the Sand. But this young lady had, had based her faith on this verse that her grandfather had taught her as John 3.16. And he didn't teach her the Bible. He taught her a poem. I keep that paper as a reminder of how different our culture is than how our culture used to be. Fifty years ago, people didn't all live as Christians, but everybody at least knew what John 3.16 was. But today there's that confusion as to what is John 3.16. What I want us to get out of this year is a familiarity with who Jesus really was and what Jesus really said, instead of just assuming that we know because we've been to church a time or two or because we, we have that poem on our wall, I want us to really get to know who Jesus is. And I think it's easy for us to assume as people who have been a part of a church and raised in what we call a Christian culture, it's easy for us to assume that we know. But I really want us to take the time to know. To focus on that. So this year I want us to take a fresh look at familiar stories. I know that this is repetitive. And, and by the time that we get to the end of Luke especially, you're going to say, I've heard this before. That's the point. I want you to hear it over and over again. I want you to be acquainted with who Jesus is. Because I want us to, to hear what Jesus was saying to us. 
I, I don't want us to just filter Jesus through our American cultural lens and say, well, this is what Christianity means. It means that, that, that cleanliness is next to godliness. Because that's not in the Bible, but everybody says it is. I want us to hear who Jesus really was, what he really said. And I want us to hear what Jesus wants us to hear. I want to hear what Jesus wants me to hear today. This week, we covered a bunch of coffee cup verses. You know what coffee cup verses are? I'll define them for you. They're verses that are very familiar. Verses that we, we've heard and we know. Verses that we have on coffee cups or verses that we have on wall hangings. The computer is not working well this morning. I, I have a number of coffee cups in my office that have verses on them. I have three of three sets. Um, that each have different verses on them. And so, how, you know, which coffee cup I grab depends on my mood. Is it, is it a green day? In other words, do I need to be still? Because that's my coffee cup verse, or the green cups is be still and know that I'm God. Or, or is it a, a red day? You will have strength. Uh, is it a strength day? I don't even remember what's on the blue ones. I think it's hope. Coffee cup verses are verses that, that we put on coffee cups, we put them on our wall hangings, because we really need to be reminded of their messages. They're messages that, that speak to us, they're messages that, that we can grasp in, in, a, in a quick second, and it, it reminds us, it kind of centers us, it kind of grounds us. And we actually had several coffee cup verses in our readings this week. And, and I don't know if they jumped out to you the way that they did to me, um, but here's a few of the coffee cup verses that we found this week. Pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. This is a coffee cup verse for um, church conferences. In fact, it's RDS's big verse. Um, our district superintendent, he, he made, he's made cups, he's made coffee cups. Um, he's actually, he, he bought the last time little pop socket rings to go on the back of your phone with this, printed, this verse printed on it. Send workers. The next one that we saw that, that may not be on a coffee cup, but it's very familiar is, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, so be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. Or what about this one? What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. It's easier for some of us than others. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Is that the hairs of your head are all numbered? Has anybody ever seen that one on a coffee cup? I need one of those. <laughs> anyway. Next in Matthew 10, 39, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. I think that's a, a one I... One speaker I've heard had that put on a bracelet to remind him of we chase so hard after the things that we're going to lose, but it's when we let go and let God that, that we actually fully start to live. And this one, then Jesus said, come unto me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. And the next one. You would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of this scripture. Actually, I put this one up there because we talked about this last week. Matthew doesn't just say it once. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. These are verses that, that we tend to have in our minds and verses that, that tend to come up. Verses that, that, that speak to us and give us a, a message that we need to hear. 
And quite honestly, this week I wanted to preach on all of them. As I, as I prepare to preach every week, I, I go through the readings for the week and I just highlight everything that jumps out at me. And almost everything was underlined. Everything was highlighted this week because all of it is so good. And it took me a long time this week just to narrow down which one of these verses I was going to preach on. Because I realized we don't have time for me to preach through all of them. So I had to pick one. And so I picked one. I'm about ready to pick up a computer and throw it too. <laughs> I was on tech support yesterday like, ah, we don't know what the cause of this lag is. You push a button and there's at least two to three seconds before it moves. Problem is, I don't know if it took my pushing the button, so I have to wait to see if it took it or... <laughs> anyway. One of my pet peeves, though, with coffee cup coffee cup verses is taking those verses out of context and people who make scripture say what it doesn't say and these these verses these coffee cup verses these familiar verses are typically verses that are taken out of context and used to twist to make something um, make the, the Bible say what the Bible doesn't say you can prove any point you want with the Bible if you just take the passage and twist it a little bit. I can find a Bible verse to support almost every lifestyle choice that you want to make. If you take it out of the context of where it's written and just twist it a little bit. My passion as a pastor, and I'm assuming after eight years you've picked up on this, is to say let's read the whole of Scripture and not just that little snippet because I don't want us to pull these verses out of context I want us to really see what the Bible says, not just what does this verse say or this word say. And quite honestly, these coffee cup verses are taken out of context probably more than any other verses. And so a lot of my preparation this week was looking at that concept, but the passage today that I chose, the context doesn't tell us much. So that was just a free um, free added bonus for this sermon really doesn't apply. It does tell us a little, and so I want us to read this verse in context as we prepare to, to unpack this. I chose Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. And we know the end of this, but the beginning is kind of unusual for us, so I want us to read this. At that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. O oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal himself. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden that I give you is light. Now this passage, it's a familiar passage. The, at least the last part of this is very familiar. The first part of this, I don't think I've ever preached on the first part of this passage as I've preached on this passage numerous times. As I go back through my old Bibles or through my Bible study software, I see all kinds of stuff highlighted, which means I've preached on this a lot. I've focused on the last three verses of this, but I've not spent much time on the first few verses, so I wanted to unpack this a little bit this morning. And I want us to do this because Matthew intentionally put these verses together. So what is, it, what is it that he wants us to see here? I found this quote as I was reading. It says, the original context of verses 25 through 30 is therefore unknown. But Matthew includes them here to show that despite the growing opposition to Jesus, discipleship remains the only alternative that satisfies the deepest of human longings. Even though 
people are starting to fight against Jesus. Matthew wanted us to understand that a true relationship with Jesus is the only thing that's going to satisfy those deep longings in our hearts. You're not going to find it in relationships. You're not going to find it in entertainment. You're not going to find it in possessions. You're going to find it in Jesus and walking hand in hand with him. It's a simple message. And I want us to, to, to appreciate the fact that Jesus today, when he says this, he says, I'm glad that you've hidden these from the wise and those who think themselves clever. Because I'm not the sharpest rock sometimes. I mean, I'm kind of like Steve, those pointy nails that aren't very sharp. I'm certainly not the smartest guy. I, I'm, I'm not the most clever. I usually think of my comebacks after the moment has passed. And then I repeatedly tell them to myself, if only I'd said this, if only I'd said that. But Jesus is saying here that the purpose of this message, the purpose of the message that he came to give us is not a message that's just reserved for the smart people. Instead, it's a message that's available to all who are open. As Nazarenes, we believe that God's grace, we call it provenient grace, it's God's grace that is calling us to himself before we even know who he is. So before we're even born, as we're, as we're coming into this world, God is putting things in our path to call us to himself. But the truth is that sometimes we get too distracted. Now the religious culture of Jesus' day and the Pharisees that Jesus was undoubtedly talking about in this passage were a group of people who spent their entire lives studying Scripture and made everybody who didn't do that feel stupid. They found great joy in making the common people look ignorant in public places. In fact, Jesus even records some of their prayers where they would come in and they would pray, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like that sinner. And Jesus says, thank you for hiding these things from the wise and those who think that they're so special and making them available to the simple. Jesus came with a message there was a message that said, I want everybody to be able to come to me and not feel like they have to be good enough to come to me. I want everybody to be able to come to me. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've lived. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how much education you have. I want everybody to be able to come to me. The problem is that sometimes we get too distracted. As I was reading this this week, a story jumped to my mind, and I think it's more appropriate this week than other weeks, of a stunt that was pulled in January of 2007, where a world-renowned violinist playing a violin valued at $15 million, it's a, a Stradivarius uh, that was made in 1713. Um, he paid somewhere upwards of $3, millions of $3 million. He wouldn't say how much, he just said millions of dollars. And the stunt was to take this world-renowned violinist and to put him in a train station in Washington, D.C. during rush hour and see if people would pay attention. You may have heard this story. In fact, I know I've used this story. I don't remember if it was here or in my last church, so you may have heard this before. But this time I have the video of this stunt. So here on the, on the left side, you see he's playing his violin. 
watch as people come by, and they don't even look at it. He's playing right now one of the most difficult violin pieces known to man. And a few people drop money in, but they don't even look at him as they do that. Finally, somebody comes and stands by the pillar for a few minutes, then looks at his watch and goes. This is the awkward part for him, he said, after the end of the songs. He didn't know what to do with himself because nobody was paying attention. A few people come and stand again, but not for long. Finally, he has an audience. One person recognized him. She had seen him in concert a few nights, a few weeks prior. This was sponsored by the Washington Post. Anybody seen this story before? Joshua Bell is the violinist, and he's played in nearly every notable venue around the world. Just in case you're wondering, he's stopping at the Adler on Thursday night. Tickets for this event, for his concerts, typically go 50 to 100 bucks each, and that's on the cheap, cheap end. And here he was playing a free concert, and only seven people, out of I think it was 1,097 people to walk by him, only seven people stopped, even for a few moments. One of those was a little child, three-year-old Evan. And he stopped, and mom didn't want to stop. And I couldn't see it in the video, and I tried to download different videos to see if I could see it, but they, they actually were, the Washington Post was outside the door taking numbers and saying, we want to interview you about your commute. And actually, they wanted to call him afterwards and say, do you remember the violinist there? Well, Evan's mom shared that she was trying to get him to, uh, uh, to daycare so she could get back to the office for meetings. But the little three-year-old, as he was going by, he just kept dawdling, and mom kept pulling him. And finally, mom, they said in the transcript, I didn't see it in the video, but they said mom had to go and block, her, put herself between the violinist and the three-year-old, and then push him to get him out the door, because he just kept staring. I think it's interesting in this passage that Jesus said that you have hidden these things from those who think themselves wise and, and clever, and revealing it to the childlike. Because that little child noticed this beautiful music that was being played and paid attention. In fact, there's a children's book now called The Man with the Violin that tells this story. Now Joshua Bell is there playing, I, I told you his, value, his violin is valued at $15 million. He is the probably the highest paid violinist in the world today. And everybody was so distracted, they didn't pay attention. Now, this was not like he was playing in, in, a, in a, a subway station that was middle class or lower class workers. It, it was, these were government officials. That was, I can't pronounce it, it's a French 
name La Elephant or something like that. People, they say people call it the elephant. But it's where all government workers, so these are high paid individuals, we're paying their salary. High paid individuals, very intelligent to be in those jobs, and they didn't see what was right in front of them. And I think this is a powerful illustration for us when it comes to how busy we are in our lives. And are we paying attention to the invitation that Jesus gives us to come to him? Now, as I watched a number of videos interviewing Joshua Bell about this, this occurrence, he said it was really hard for him. He's a child prodigy. He grew up in, he was born in Bloomington, Indiana. His father was Episcopal priest. His mother was Jewish. That's why I was asking you earlier, Chad, did you know him? Because you were in Bloomington about that era. Um, but from early age, I mean, he was, he was on the Today Show, I think, in his teenage years, playing his violin. He was a child prodigy. He's brilliant. And he said he'd never played where people didn't stop to appreciate it. The story continues, and he put a bookend on it. He actually did. The, Met, the D.C. Metro invited him to come back for a concert. And this time they publicized it, and the place was absolutely packed with people who were, who were there to just sit and absorb this music because then they knew who he was. But only seven people out of a thousand stopped. And the article continues to say how this is really a sad statement on our American culture that we are so consumed with our schedules that we miss life. Now if any of you happen to run into Joshua Bell this week, he said one of the neat things is hearing how many pastors use this as an illustration. So if any of you run into him this week by chance, just say, hey, my pastor used that story this Sunday too. <laughs> Thought you might run into him. Jesus in this passage is acknowledging our tendencies towards distraction. And there are a lot of things that distract us. One of the big distractions that we face is when we think ourselves too wise or clever. And so we're just not going to pay attention to that little stuff. We have more important things to do. This is a trap that I fall into a lot. I, I get so focused on what I've got to do that I don't pay attention to life happening all around me. And then Jesus kind of transitions to talk about the son's perspective on his father. The religious leaders of that day have painted a very bad image of God. They really have made him inaccessible to the average person. But Jesus knows better. In fact, Jesus knows the father better than anyone. And he uses this middle section of this passage to call out and to say, I know who my father is. And I'm thankful that I know who my father is. And he's not somebody that you want to be too distracted and ignore. Several of the scholars that I was reading talked about going to funerals for well-renowned people. And as they were in these services, they would hear all of these wonderful things that were said about this person and all that they accomplished in life. But the real question was, who were they at home? And I think for me, over the last five years, I've been in a bit of a crisis trying to, to say, I don't want to be somebody really nice on stage on Sunday morning and be a jerk at home because that's what I was. But a part of what God has been doing in my heart is, is trying to make me the same person at home as I am when I'm in front. And I think that, I hope that, when the time comes for my funeral, that my girls will have some nice things to say about their father and not just say he was so absorbed with everything else that he never paid any attention to us or he was inaccessible to us. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, I know who my father is. 
I know who he is, and I know that you want to know him too. I know that you want to bring all your struggles to him because of who he is. And he's just not the person that the Pharisees are painting him to be. He's not this person that's inaccessible. He's not this person that only pays attention to the poor, or I mean to the rich, or to the, to the educated. He's accessible to all. And then comes the familiar part. Come to me. And I want us just to process slowly what Jesus is saying. Come to me, all who are weary. Anybody weary today? Come to me, all who are weary. As you saw in this, in this video, we live in a culture that values wearing yourself out. There were a couple of people that they interviewed after this, the man who was standing against the pillar for a few minutes and then looked at his watch and walked out and they said, did you have any idea who this was? And he said, no. He said, I studied violin and gave it up when I was 18. I didn't know who the guy was. I didn't recognize him, but I clearly could tell that he was talented but I knew I had to get to work or I'd get fired. And the other people who were saying, oh, I'm, I just zoned out, I wasn't paying any attention. I... We live in a culture that values being exhausted. One of the most prideful statements that I make when somebody asks how I'm doing is, oh, I'm worn out. I take pride in that. I've worn myself out for the job that I have. That's not something to be proud of. It's a part of what God's working on me with right now is stop wearing yourself out. Stop chasing so much. All who are weary, come to me all who carry heavy burdens. I think that's most of us. One of the things that I try to do as I'm slowing down and not just run, run, running is I try to take the church directory and I pray for everybody in the church directory at least three or four times a week. And as you share prayer requests with me, that's the time that as I look at your name in the church directory, that's the time that, that I, I pray for those requests that you give me. And for those of you who aren't in the church directory but you come regularly, I've written your names in there. Everybody in here today is in there. I pray for each one of you. And I know the burdens that you're facing. Some of them. And some of you don't share those burdens. But you're facing heavy burdens. I think one of the things that I realize is the most challenging is, is seeing people looking like they have it all together. And then in a conversation they reveal just what they're struggling with or what they're facing. And I think all too often, we don't see the heavy burdens that other people are carrying. But Jesus says to come to him, all who are weary, all who are carrying heavy burdens, and he will give us rest. Rest. Something that our culture doesn't value very much. We've made it to where you can't even rest without spending a ton of money. You have to go on these big fancy vacations to, to rest. You, you have to accomplish all these things to rest. Well, the rest is more exhausting than the regular work. But Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you. You know, that's a word that we don't know much about. We tend to think of eggs and we think of yolks. That was a really bad yolk, I'm sorry. <laughs> the yoke that Jesus is referring to here is the yoke that, that goes between two oxen to, to keep them together so that they will carry 
the burden together. They will plow together. They will pull the wagon together. Now Jesus was a carpenter. And in that day, chairs had not been invented. So carpenters really focus their attention on agricultural needs and one of the things that they built was yokes and the legends tell us that Jesus was the best yoke maker in Galilee we don't know if that's true or not it may just be that we've made that up so that we could preach this sermon I don't know but I do know that there's a very if you've just got one thing in a yoke one little splinter it'll make that ox really have a hard time doing the work but Jesus knows the neck of every ox that he makes the yoke for Jesus knows us he knows how many hairs we have left and he custom fits that yoke to us he says let me teach you let me tell you what's important and what needs your attention and what doesn't need your attention. Because we live in a culture that tells us you need to pay attention to everything except what's really important. And Jesus says, I am humble and gentle at heart. And then he says again, you will find rest for your souls. Come to me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke and you will find rest. I think I'm learning this lesson and I usually learn these lessons painfully. Times when I, I just have too much on my plate and, and it's those moments that I, that I have to question, why am I doing all of this? And usually, like now, because I've already committed myself to do all of these things. But Jesus says, come to me, and you will find rest for your souls. Because his yoke is easy to bear, and the burden that he gives is light. I found a quote this week by N.T. Wright. Technology is not my friend. And N.T. Wright says this. He says, how could following Jesus really be that easy? Didn't he say himself that people had to be prepared to leave behind their family, their possessions, even their own life? Yes, he did. But the ease and the joy and the rest and refreshment which he offered all spring from his own inner character, his gentleness and warmth to all who turn to him, weighed down by burdens, moral, physical, emotional, financial, or whatever. He is offering what he has in himself to offer. What Jesus is saying here is come to me if you're flat out exhausted. Come to me if you, if you don't have the strength to go on. Because my burden is easy and my yoke is light. We've spent a lot of time over the last few weeks talking about the uncomfortable gospel of Matthew. How, how almost every story in Matthew's gospel is uncomfortable. But as I was studying this week, it hit me, who's it uncomfortable for? Matthew's gospel is not uncomfortable for those who are genuinely seeking after God. Matthew's gospel is uncomfortable for those who are focused on keeping up appearances. Matthew's gospel is uncomfortable for those who are insisting that things be done their way. Matthew's gospel is uncomfortable for those who take great pride in their wisdom and being clever. But for those who are genuinely struggling and want to seek to find the, the, the meaning in life and the answer to those deepest longings, 
gospel message is not uncomfortable. It's the most comfortable yoke that you'll ever find. As we learn to walk in intimacy with Jesus and allow him to, to shape the yoke, then all of the stuff that seems so overwhelming is no longer so overwhelming as we learn to walk with him. And I want to ask you this morning as the worship team comes. Are you able to come to Jesus? When Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. When I ask, are you weary? Almost every hand went up. In fact, some of you were thinking of doing it this way. We're exhausted. Why don't we come? to Jesus. Are we too distracted? Are we so focused on getting stuff done? Or maybe we just think we're too wise for that. We're too smart for that. Or maybe we just have a view of God that says he doesn't want us to come anyway. He's just God is just something that's out there but not really caring about us. Or maybe we're uncomfortable because coming to God the way that Jesus calls us to come to him would mean acknowledging that we're not together as much as we want to present that we're together. But as we take this journey with Jesus, we focus really in Matthew's gospel on the question of come follow me. And as how he aimed that at his disciples. But this morning I want us to leave with this question in our mind. Will we come? Jesus is calling to all of us to come to him. To come to him with our burdens. To come to him with our concerns, our worries, the realities of this life. Will we come? Or are we too distracted? Or do we think we're above that? Do we not see how accessible God is? Or does it make us uncomfortable? I hope that you'll find some time in this week to spend some time in prayer asking this question of yourself. Am I coming to Jesus? Or am I just spinning out of control like these people on the high-speed video going through the train station? Am I missing the life that God has created me for because I'm so busy chasing? Let's stand together as we close this song.